Taiwan, a country I'm proud to say I'm from. In my career as a media entrepreneur, I've spoken to movers and shakers here who make global headlines. But what I'm most excited about are the up and coming forces of my generation. They're young, they're creative, they dare to defy the status quo. Follow me as I meet emerging leaders of Taiwan who lift us, who inspire us, who are changing the world, starting in Taiwan. This is Game Changers with Emily Waiwu. Hey, welcome back to the show. We're coming to you from Taiwan, a country of 23 million people of incredible diversity. Now today, we meet a policy advocate, a journalist, a community organizer who's furthering the rights of indigenous people everywhere. Tuhi Matukau is from the Pinu Yamayan Nation, one of the 16 recognized indigenous nations here, each with their own distinct language, culture, and customs. Their presence in Taiwan have predated thousands of years of foreign settlers and colonization here on this island. And today, the indigenous population makes up just 2.5% of population in Taiwan, but together, they're part of the Austronesian peoples in the Asia Pacific region. Our guest today, Tuhi, She's participated in the United Nations, she's recruited domestic youth groups, she's a media personality, and she's figuring out a long-term strategy with a youth participation of an indigenous peoples in Taiwan. Here's Doohy. Hi. Game changer today. <laughs> Welcome. So good to have you. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm really excited to talk to you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> First of all, to kind of introduce you to our guests, and there's a really famous pop star in Taiwan. Her name is A Pao. Mm -hmm. um, she sings only in her indigenous language. And you actually had a hand in translating one of her music. What did it mean to you to be that bridge, to be mm -hmm. translating that for the world? Well, I will say, well, actually, I didn't only translate the album for her, but for several indigenous artists or singers. I think it's very important for me to, you know, because I'm coming from that background, so I can choose the right words with awareness to set the message with every terms that I express or I choose to use. And uh, so that will give the songs or the lyrics another life, I will say, and also for to open up another door for the international audience or or you know like fans to get to know not only about her music but also her culture and of course about Taiwan. So you've been an advocate for indigenous rights for a very long time. Um, when you were 21 years old um, in 2006 you went to the UN for the very first time. Um, at some point you became the co-chair of the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus mm -hmm. for about five years. Yep. At this time, when you're working with the international community, what do you tell them about what's happening back home? Well, um, at first when I was in the, at the United Nations, actually I knew, I barely knew anything about indigenous peoples in Taiwan. So I met a lot of indigenous, indigenous youth from the world at that time. And they were asking me about, for example, because that was 2006 and in Taiwan we adopted uh, the indigenous peoples basic law in 2005. And people knows about that because it's very, it's a very progressive thing. Which was? <laughs> because it's uh, like uh, in a quite high level in a legal framework for a country to really pass a law to, to protect or to really define what is the rights of indigenous peoples and what's the duty, what's the responsibility of the uh, government. Uh, to do to really ensure the rights of indigenous peoples will be fulfilled, will be uh, implemented. And that is very rare in the international society. So people were asking me about that, like what kind of path uh, indigenous peoples in Taiwan took so we can really have this law passed and also like what's the impact for the people here. And I really cannot say anything to that because I knew nothing <laughs> at that time as a university student. But very sarcastically, I can tell them what's the difference between Republic uh, of China and People's Republic of China was why there's PRC and uh, ROC and also the civil war between the Nationalist Party and you know the Chinese Communist Party. I can tell them all these histories. I can name the rivers in mainland China, but not the rivers in Taiwan or like the mountains in Taiwan. So I was really like thinking about that. 
what happened to me and what happened to this generation of uh, kids in Taiwan. So that's why I came back to Taiwan and started learning. So in a way, your introduction to indigenous rights was via, through the globe, right? Yeah. Some um, grassroots activists uh, start from local and then they go global. You kind of went the other way yeah. around. <laughs> exactly. It's about 90 countries in the world that do have indigenous yeah. populations. Mm -hmm. And so what was the sense that you got at the time that the global challenges for indigenous peoples was at the time? Okay. So at that time, like the, the most important topic we were talking about is climate change also like the slightly or like um, how this cross-nation uh, development would impact uh, a really remote community really far away from the world and the other thing is that I really learned from is the mental health mm -hmm. especially about identity mm -hmm. like sexual identity and also um, uh, indigenous identity and how that would affect our path to education, to career, to health, and all these things. Yeah, my gosh, to be 21 years old and to be at the UN and working with all these, my guess is very inspiring, very intelligent people from around the world. Um, I don't remember what I was doing at 21. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, all that learning. And then afterwards, um, in 2013, when you were 29, you founded your own working group. Mm -hmm. Um, for indigenous Taiwanese youth. What was that community like that mm -hmm. you thought this was kind of the future for indigenous rights um, coming from youth in Taiwan? What, what was in your head at the time? I'm mm -hmm. so curious. <laughs> uh, actually, I came back in, uh, to Taiwan in 2011 after my master uh, program. At Germany. Germany, yeah, from Germany. And then uh, that was the very first time I started to really be friends, make friends with indigenous youth in Taiwan and also to really involve in all this movement. And um, so I was really like this, this uh, idea was getting stronger that I should, we should have something that we can have like, it's also like a safe house, something like that in concept that we can talk about politics, we can talk about culture, we can talk about families, we can talk about how to be an indigenous and how it is to be an indigenous in this society. So we started kind of from the street, from protest, and then we started to get some like reports or some articles that we would like to read together, to discuss together. And uh, just slowly we kind of form like a group or a group of friends that we can talk serious things, but we can also hang out, have fun together. And What kind of topics were you tackling? We, we talk a lot about um, how do we survive in the urban setting, because most of us, we work or we uh, study in Taipei. Mm -hmm. And actually, Taipei is not that friendly in a way to indigenous youth who mm -hmm. came all the way from the community directly to the city the setting. It's very different and also with uh, with all these stereotypes and also discrimination with all different terms. And sometimes just because, for example, if I say, oh, I'm indigenous, people will say, oh, you must be good at singing. Maybe you can sing a song for me. Well, I would say that people would think it's a compliment to say you are good at singing. But for us, it's actually stereotypes. I would say I was very late to be enlightened to the international or to the indigenous movement or the rights of the indigenous peoples. So I would I was thinking that maybe we can sort of bring this process of the enlightenment a bit earlier for younger generation. If we want to do indigenous rights, uh, indigenous people's rights uh, movement, we don't have to become lawyers. Mm -hmm. For every of us, we don't have to study law. It's very important for us to be in different sectors, mm. but with the awareness mm -hmm. to do things. So in a way more diverse, that mm. means we're more united. It was really important for you to kind of want to figure it out a way for your peers, for mm. the youth um, at the time to have different paths, right? Ways of changing policy, you could become a politician and mm -hmm. change policy. You could be a lobbyist, you could yeah. be a lawyer, uh, you could be an activist. You wanted to widen that scope mm -hmm. of work for everybody. Mm -hmm. Is that what was was that what was your bigger vision at the time? Um, you know, to do this all this advo uh, advocacy could be fun and sexy. So it's not only to have protests on the street or to go to, for example, legislat uh, legislative UN to lobby the legislators. 
There are a lot of other things we can do for theaters, for dance, for performing art, mm -hmm. or you know, or for just the TV channel you choose.、Mm -hmm. With awareness, that、mm -hmm. is already something we're making difference, we're making change, and not to mention that to to go out to vote、mm -hmm. or how we are expressing or how we are choosing the information we're going to post on our Facebook or Instagram. That's everything is actually. Part of the the work. Yeah, so it's 15 years since you first stepped into the UN.、Um, about eight years, <laughs> right? Since you organized and founded the youth group for Taiwanese youth. How did you measure that success? What are some of those impact that you said? Yeah, you know what? This group, we made our dent. We made that difference.、Um, there's more work to be done, of course,、mm -hmm. right?、Um, but but we made that impact here.、Mm -hmm. Well, it's very actually it's very hard to to evaluate that. Because you know, if we really want to make changes, it's it takes time. For now, I will say the biggest success I have is that I have lifelong partners that I know I can do a lot of work with. We can fight for our rights together, but we can also share our daily lives, our you know ordinary lives together. I think that's important because if we want to do right advocacy for a long term, you need partners,、mm -hmm. and you need someone who really understand why you are doing this, and also you need someone to really be able to communicate with,、mm -hmm. to argue with,、mm -hmm. to really you know because rights is like the concept of different rights is not really. Frozen at the time or the space, it's evolving,、mm -hmm. and we need people to talk about that, to to figure out that、uh, evolution, and also to figure out then how can we fit the concept to the different time of the era, and then we can adjust what do we want to do. On the evolving rights, what are some of the most urgent issues right now? The first thing pop. Pop up for me is participation, because in the past we will say if we have a meeting, then we have indigenous representative, we have、uh, re representative for a woman, we have youth, or sometimes we even we have children,、mm. and we think that's just that's fair.、Mm. But now it's not like that. We cannot just sit there. Only, but we should be able from different sectors, from different, you know, all these representatives, our voices would should be discussed seriously, and also really into the decision making process, not just to have someone sitting at the table. And also for people to really understand that if we want to talk about something, we should have the one who would be impacted by that decision to be able to provide their point of views. But sometimes, for politics or for policies,、yeah. imagination sometimes is quite dangerous、yeah. because we will be thinking, "Oh, maybe that's very."、Uh, I think that's good for you, but actually, for the people who are really in the issue, it's not something they want. So it sounded like the working group that you founded in 2013, with the collection of youth that you、um, recruited, that you know,、um, I, I think that you guys. Every year after that, you participated in as many international organizations as you can, in international events as you can. What is something that each of us you came back with in arms, saying that okay, now I will disseminate what I've learned, and I will now groom even more、um, more people、mm -hmm. into the future generations. Well, one I can give one story is that because the United Nations, the first thing we have to learn is to write a statement with logic, you know, with like. Uh, so we first, prop, first we have to tell the fact and also the impact, the influence, and also the problems it causes, and most importantly, the recommendation.、Mm -hmm. And that's the weakest part, as like because we've never really learned from school that if we want to solve a problem, we can think from ourselves first. It's just like okay, you just do whatever you are told,、yeah. and that's the first thing we have to change. And I think that was in 2012 or 2013. That the, like the very beginning of our working group, and there was an issue happened、uh, down to the south in Pingdong. There was a bridge that was built, but without the consent from the local indigenous communities, and also how the bridge because it's more for, it's for tourists, and how the、mm. bridge is.、Um, Uh, the management of the bridge and also the income. How can they like distribute the income to the local community? There, there was no discussion about that. So some of my my partners、uh, from the group, they really organized the youth from their communities, and they wrote a statement 
with very concrete recommendations to different sectors that is involved in this that was involved in this process of this bridge thing. And that mm. worked. Mm. They put their people into the management of the bridge. So that's something like it's in a very short time, but because we, we were trained at United Nations and also you know, with all this process. So they know clearly they have to propose something. Otherwise, people will just make decisions for them. And then that might be something they don't want. Everything that we have in Taiwan, we're incredibly privileged to be here, but there are these real life, I think, negotiation um, skills um, that some of you only get because you were given that opportunity to mm. go to the UN and now you come back to really make a difference here, you know, whether it's by um, training the youth here or doing groundwork yourself, which uh, we want to get to later on because you do hold a lot of community events now back um, at the homes of your parents and your elders. Yeah. 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 Welcome back to the show. This is where I talk to really cool people in Taiwan doing really interesting things in the world and back home in Taiwan. Today, we've been talking to Duhi. You grew up in the city. Um, your mother's indigenous, your father's not. And you didn't actually grow up speaking the mother tongue. Um, so there's a path to kind of reclaiming your identity. Mm -hmm. um, when you were 18 years old, you added your mother's name yep. to your ID so you can reclaim indigenous status. Yeah. So growing up, you know, what did you remember about visiting your mother's village mm -hmm. and the elders? What was that relationship like? Well, I will say that I've been growing up with this sense of in-betweenness. That when I was when I was in the city, because I have uh, brown skin and also like my my figure on, on my face, that like, people will really recognize me as indigenous. And uh, but when I'm back to the community, they will say, Ah, oh, this is the girl from Taipei not like from the village or from the community. So for me, it's always like I have these two parallel worlds. One is in Taipei, one is in Taitung, back to my mom's uh, community. And um, so this kind of in-betweenness has been with me until like I'm 20 something. And the mm. very first time I started to feel feel in is uh, when my grandfather passed away because I stay in the community for like almost a month because we have a very, very long uh, process of a uh, funeral mm. uh, combining indigenous and Taiwanese. So at that time, I really got to, to learn my relatives, <laughs> like, like the right relationship between the relatives and also the stories, the history of my own family. And that's the really first time I start to feel that I'm part of this society. What did you learn about that history? Well, for example, that I the, the first thing I knew is that actually my grandfather, he's also a mix. <laughs> so we do have not only been Mayan blood, but also Pimpu, uh, blood from the Pimpu uh, peoples. And also uh, part of his ancestors are from uh, Pingdong. Mm -hmm. So they travel all the way to Taidong and also like uh, from my uh, grandmother's family. We do have this uh, bloodline of being um, traditional healers. And healers? That, yeah, traditional healers. That's why we do have this sense of connecting to the other world of this, uh, with the spirits. And, and nowadays, I mean, as an adult, um, you bring um, uh, workshops and community events back to the villages. Yeah. I will say that it's actually for, um, as I said, I think all this work can be fun and sexy and can be cute. Very sexy. <laughs> and that's why I try to, for example, I try to uh, invite some of the community members to go abroad with me to different events, indigenous events. And also I have some like theater group to the community to talk about serious things, but in very interesting way. What is it that do you really want to lead for the next generation? I think it's a beautiful thing to have all these diversities in our communities and also in our society. But we need to recognize that diversity, but somehow I think it's important for us to ignore all these differences because we are all different. Mm. And uh, also for the kids, because for the kids or for the younger generations, then they don't have to choose to be become someone mm. they are expected to. Or for mm. me, like I was asked a lot, like, why do you, why did you choose to become an indigenous? 
It's a weird question because, of course, legally I had to go through this process of having my mother's uh, name uh, to my name. So that's why legally I can have this indigenous status. But it's not by choosing to decide who you are. It's more like I'm growing up with that and I'm also growing up to that mm -hmm. because I need to learn all this knowledge, cultures, traditions and also how it is. Um, as an indigenous person, but also as a Taiwanese. So what I want to say is that like for the next generation, they don't have to choose their identities and we don't need to ask for the identities because we are that. And yeah. we are that mixture, we are that diversity ourselves. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us today. I mean, yes, your work at the UN, yes, your work back home in Taiwan, um, bringing together Taiwanese youth, the bigger cause, but also sharing your personal path because I think me, myself, and everybody here and everybody's watching, I think we probably all have some kind of an identity that we are um, coming in terms with, mm -hmm. right? And that takes process, that takes a lot of courage. Um, it takes a community to help us get to where we are today. Mm -hmm. um, so one final question before we let you go to pursue your five-year plan uh, is something that we ask everybody. How much of what you've accomplished so far um, was given to you versus how much did you have to fight for? Hmm. Um, well, I, I want to start with one quote first. Culture is our mana. Mana is uh, Hawaii uh, language, that means strength. Mm -hmm. And cultural, culture is also our resistance, the core of our resistance. So I will say that, of course, I, I'm very proud and I'm very, I appreciate a lot that my community and also indigenous peoples in Taiwan, despite all the difficulties, we're still here. And this is the resistance I got from that. And also not only indigenous peoples in Taiwan, but also indigenous peoples around the world, we have that resistance. I was awarded by that, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, given that strength. And now what I can do is really to, again, to have that resistance, to have that money, to more perspectives, to more work that I've, I'm trying to do. So yeah, I would say it's like, a, I cannot really say how much is what, but it's like a mutual process and it's evolving. It's like a, cir uh, a circulation. I love that. Resisting and just being strong, kind of find that inner strength and resist all you can. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for today. Thank you for having me. And thank you for being a game changer in increasing youth participation in an indigenous issues around the world, in Taiwan and globally. So audience, thank you for staying with us today. If you're also a game changer in your community, please get in touch. And as always, I'm Emily Waiwu. This is Tukima Dugal. And you're watching Taiwan Plus. Follow and subscribe on all social networks. See you again soon.